you everyone. Um, it really isn't a tech conference without some technical difficulties, so thank you for bearing with us today. Um, so, as she mentioned, we'll be talking about how continuous delivery in DevOps really can make your IT transformation awesome. So, first, you know, Nicholas Carr, he wrote this article in Harvard Business Review in 2003, and he didn't just say IT doesn't matter. The title of the paper was IT doesn't matter, so that sucks, right? So many people kept thinking that just IT didn't matter. And the underlying principle and the underlying thoughts, the thesis of the paper was that IT just was never going to help you make a difference in your business. It's gonna help you keep up. You're gonna have to do it. It's like eating your vegetables, brushing your teeth. But it was never gonna make a difference. It was never gonna make you awesome. <coughs> well, turns out times have changed. Things are totally different now. And if we do IT the right way, with the right practices, the right processes, the right technology, IT not even just matters, it will make things awesome. It will help you leapfrog on your competition, and one of those things that makes it awesome is continuous delivery. So, here's what we're gonna talk about today. Again, times and IT have changed. DevOps is good for IT, DevOps is good for organizations. We'll talk about what drives that change. One of it is tooling and automation, and here is continuous delivery, so we'll dig into that a little bit. Another one is using uh, lean management practices, those practices and processes, also having a good culture. So, back when Nicholas Carr wrote this paper, it was back when IT was just a cost center, right? People would buy servers, they would throw them in closets, they would put those really, really pretty up lighting, which was nice, but it just wasn't enough because <coughs> the competitor could buy the same server and be thrown in another closet. Or they could do really, really hard things, like buy ERP systems. You could throw consultants in the problem, but you know what, your competitors could do the exact same thing. It wasn't, um, wasn't giving you something that was a competitive advantage, and it especially wasn't doing something that we call a sustained competitive advantage. It was giving you what we call a point of parity, but not a point of distinction. Well, then something came along and they started, people started realizing in tech that the things that we found out in the lean manufacturing movement, in the Toyota movement, could be applied to the software development and delivery process. And if we embraced these types of methodologies and these types of practices, we could make our software and our technology better and awesome. We started hearing some of these stories really early Starting in about uh, 2009, um, we started hearing it in 2007, but really 2009 was kind of a groundbreaking moment. Um, at the Velocity Conference, Ospa Hammond told the story about the dev and ops cooperation at Flickr doing 10 deploys per day. We've seen those numbers skyrocket ever since at places like Etsy, um, places like Amazon, places like Netflix. But I like stories, but I also really, really like data. My background is research. And, you know, I'm always a skeptic in the room. I'm the one that says, oh, that story is nice, but is it actually going to apply to me? And so I started working with some of my colleagues, um, Jean Kim, Jess Humble, the folks at Puppet Labs, and we decided to dig in and really get some data to see if this is actually applicable. Does it work everywhere? Can it generalize? Or is it just a handful of little companies that find a way to do their special sauce or fake the numbers and do special math to make it work <laughs> in ways that just don't apply, right? Okay, so as we start digging in here and, and looking at what's going on, who here is on the dev side of the house? Who is dev, okay? Who here is ops? Okay, who here does like project management and agile and, okay, fantastic. So. As we start talking through this, think about how it applies to you and, and how we can use this as we're on our own journey. So, just as a refresher, DevOps really kind of comprises three key things. Part of it really is the tooling and automation. We need some kind of technological piece, although you can't just buy something and plug it in, okay? It's not just gonna be the tech, because you know what? HP LaserJet firmware was made awesome using Firmware, okay? So you can do it on old tech. People who say they just use legacy and they can't do the DevOps, nope, totally wrong. 
Um, DevOps is also <coughs> using good practices and processes, um, hearkening back to management um, <coughs> discipline. It's also making sure you have a really good organizational culture. Okay. Um, tip here, research shows that these drive IT performance and organizational performance. Uh, so I mentioned this started back at 2009 Velocity, John Osbach, Paul Hammond, 10 deploys per day. At the time, this was sort of groundbreaking, revolutionary. People didn't think it was possible, or they thought it was super, super mean for the operations people in here, right? A lot of the time when we like think about a deploy coming, we're not super happy, right? <laughs> this is painful, I come from an ops background. A deployment meant that like, Developers were throwing something over that proverbial wall, sometimes Friday at 5 p.m., they were going to happy hour, and we were just going to die <coughs> and panic and try to fire stuff. But things went up from there. So Amazon, now some of their deployment stats that they released, I believe it's uh, 2011, their maximum deploys in a single hour. They're seeing a deploy about every 11 and a half seconds. These numbers are amazing. Um, on average, we're seeing 10,000 hosts receiving deploys, and then on maximum, 30,000 hosts. Although people say these numbers are cheating because Amazon has more servers than God. What do we see from other places like Etsy? Check out Etsy's stats. Now, Mike Britton gave a talk in 2013 and said, what once required six to 14 hours in their deployment army. Now, in 2013, took 15 minutes and a single person. They were doing 30 deploys per day. So if we can get our technology wrapped up and our practices and process and a good culture, we can make our deploys lean, mean, efficient. On March 2014, they were up to 50 deploys per day, and April 2014, they were up to 80 and 90 deploys per day. So your processes continue to iterate, they continue to improve, so let's cut to the chase. DevOps is good for organizations. A lot of the time we're trying to convince bosses, management, that investments in technology, that investments in tooling, that investments in people and processes are actually worth it. Here you go. When we compare high performing organizations and low performing organizations, we see double. So high performing organizations are twice as likely to exceed profitability, productivity, and market share. So this is great. Um, this, this number is pulled from the literature. Um, for the second number, this has a little asterisk next to it because I was only able to do this analysis for people that volunteer a stock ticker symbol and I did the analysis for those that were publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. But for those, they showed a 50% higher market cap growth over the previous three year period. So we're definitely showing real promise in direct <coughs> contributions to the bottom line of the entire company. IT is making a real impact, right? It's not just something that you do to keep up anymore. We're driving real, real, real change. So let's take a step back and see how we're driving that change. We're driving it by contributing to IT. And IT performance, when we talk about this, is three key things. Deployment frequency. This isn't just uh, delivery and release. This isn't necessarily going all the way through to your customers. This is the ability to push code um, all the way through your pipeline and have it ready to push to your customers whenever you're ready. This makes it now a business decision to release all the way to customers and not a technology limitation. Uh, this is also a mean time to recover. How long does it take you to come back from any kind of incident? This is also lead time for changes. So the time from code to commit to code deploy. Notice the first and the third are throughput metrics. It's how fast you can get those changes through your system. And also mean time to recover the stability metric. Here's something to pay attention to that's really, really, really interesting here. For years, we've been told that you can only have one and not the other. And it's usually that we're told that we have to slow down we have to tamp down on that speed in order to get stability. It's not true. I don't see it anywhere in the data, and we, have, we don't see it for years. Throughput and stability go together. And it's really exciting and really fantastic. So, 
What does this mean? So when we look at high-performing DevOps teams, they're more agile. They get higher throughput. They can make these changes faster. We see 30 times more frequent deployments. So they're pushing code through the system. They're smaller pieces of code, but they can make good changes. They can get fast feedback. If something is small and if something breaks the build, they know exactly what it was. Um, they get faster lead, 200 times faster lead times from their peers, code commit to code deploy. Those exciting new fun things that you find out from your customer, you can get all the way through that pipeline. If you have compliance or regulatory changes, you can push those through the pipeline. Um, high performing DevOps teams are also more reliable. So they have a better change success rate. I didn't mention this previously because when we do all the, like, the fancy stats, I wrote science on things. So when we do all the fancy stats, it isn't a classifier or a predictor of IT performance, but it is still statistically different. It is significantly different between the high and low performers, so I mention it here. When you do introduce a change into your, um, into your code, high performers and low performers, the change is much more likely to be successful in the high performers than the low performers. And then look at MTTR. If you do have any kind of incident, service degradation, anything unplanned, the high performers are much more likely to, to recover from that very, very quickly. So, as I mentioned before, DevOps promises and delivers more throughput, more stability in tandem. And it's without the trade-offs that ITIL has told us that we're gonna just have to deal with and plan on having don't see those trade-offs. They just aren't there. So what does that mean for us? We talked about agility. When we think about these frequent deployments and faster lead times, for those of us in the crowd that were dev, project management, even ops, okay? Think about new content delivery. When we have new content delivery, when we need to deliver value for our business, how much faster can we get that through to our customers? We can think about value and savings around A-B testing. How do we know which things are actually good for our customers? When we can do A-B testing, we can push that A-B test through our pipeline, and then we can even push through the removal of features that are value add. Talk about speed to market and opportunity costs, any compliance and regulatory changes, any security vulnerabilities we can push through. When you talk about things that are more reliable, what do we think about value and savings around reliability and uptime? Also uh, compliance and security, and even just the reputation about compliance and security. What happens when you're the guy on the block that gets hacked? Or you're the guy on the block that gets hacked like four times? Or what happens when you're the company on the block that does not get hacked and everyone else does? That's a lot that you can say about that because you were the one that was able to address all of those vulnerabilities. Um, speaking about A-B testing, uh, Ronnie Kohavi did this fantastic experiment at Microsoft. So when we think about adding features to our products and our services, we generally think we have a pretty good idea of what our customers want, right? Who here knows what, our, what their customers want? <laughs> no hands. <laughs> I'd like to just reflect the record. There are no hands up. My hand is up. There are no hands up. Um, but like in theory, Okay, who here has business leaders who know what their customers want and they ask us to build things? Yeah, no, we got hands. Okay, I just needed to clarify. So our business leaders know what our customers want and they ask us to build things. So Microsoft was in that position, right? They're like, we know our customers, we've been making Office for years, we've been doing all of our web property, we know exactly what our customers want. We don't need to do A-B testing. And Ronnie Kohab is like, in general, we're only about 50-50 at best finally convinced them that they should be doing A-B testing. Turns out only about a third of very well thought out, very well designed, perfectly you know, constructed ideas deliver value. One third net you nothing, and one third cost you things. Either they cost you money, they make customers go away, it's a bad thing. So imagine what you do in that situation. If you implement every single one of those things, you could be at a net zero. That sucks. All of that work for nothing. But also, if you actually implement the things that give you nothing, 
You've now introduced all of this complexity and technical debt into your code. Now you have all of this extra work you have to support. But if you can do A-B testing, you now know which one-third of those features are the magic one-third that make you money or give you customer engagement or make your customers happy. But without the ability to easily introduce features and easily pull back you know, or undo all of those features, we just don't know. Uh, we also talked about the value of reliability and uptime. Netflix is a great example of this. Um, are you guys familiar with the story of when AWS crashed super hard several years ago mm -hmm. in the States? So AWS went down. Netflix was fine. There was a big conspiracy theory that maybe Netflix was fine because they were a special customer, and so they had a special account with special servers just for Netflix. Not the case at all. We found out later that what happened was Netflix had been preparing for things to randomly die. They actually waited several, several hours, I think it was five hours before they even declared a step one. Turns out it was because they had a thing called the Chaos Monkey. Are we familiar with Chaos Monkey? You don't choose Chaos Monkey. Chaos Monkey chooses you. <laughs> they had been preparing for something like this. And so by the time something like this happened, they were totally prepared. They, they had a few services degraded, like maybe recommendations didn't work, maybe the rating system didn't work, but, but overall the service was still fine. By the way, Chaos Monkey is open source, so you can, you can actually use it. So by building in these types of things, our own work gets better. And we want to prepare for failures, right? It's like hiring firemen and tell, just having firemen tell you don't start fires. No, we want to have them practice on on situations that are bad so that they can get better at putting out fires. We want to have our own engineers and our own systems practice on what happens when things go down so that if we have an incident or an outage or something that goes down, we're better at responding. So, there were a few key factors that correlated with each component. Uh, notice that for MTTR, the time for change is deployment frequency. Version control is pretty consistent throughout. You see monitoring is good, automated testing is good, continuous delivery is important. Um, culture, job satisfaction, climate for learning. But I really wanted to be able to dig in here. So it was a quick, you know, mid-check. Um, we know IT performance is part of, is comprised of throughput and stability. Both are possible without trade-offs. IT performance contributes to org performance. When I say org performance, that means money, right? IT performance makes our companies better now helps us make money. By the way, culture is a key predictor of both IT performance and organizational performance. We know that automation and tooling are important. But when we did the follow-on for the study the second year, or the, the next year when we were really kind of doing some solid science, we really wanted to figure out what drives IT and organizational performance. So what we did as we, as we dove in here and we backed it up and we said continuous delivery. We know that continuous delivery is a good key piece, but what makes up continuous delivery? And so when we dig into the data, continuous delivery is comprised of these things. Test deployment and automation, continuous integration, and all production artifacts <coughs> being in version control. Now in the data, what does this mean? So, for the first year of iteration, this is what we took a look at. What is test automation? Test automation are these things, okay? Developers primarily create and maintain acceptance tests. Your developers need to be doing this, not QA, not someone else. The people that are actually doing development need to be creating and maintaining your acceptance tests. When your automated tests pass, your developers need to be confident that the software is releasable. Test failures actually need to indicate a real defect. It needs to be easy for developers to fix acceptance test failures. Developers should share a common pool of test suckers and reduce acceptance test failures. And developers should use their own development environment to reproduce acceptance test failures. Those were some of the, 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 the key things that really helped define what was test automation. Uh, when we looked at deployment automation, we, we asked what percentage of deployments were automated. When we looked at continuous integration, these were the things that were key here. Oh, sorry, that first one, yeah. 
that. Sorry. I'll get back to you on that one. I have a copy paster. Um, when we take a look at version control, there's a key here in version control. And the key here is that it's version control for all of our production artifacts. Okay? So it's that our application code is in a version control system, our system configurations, our application configurations, and our scripts for automating build configurations. So it's not just our application code. We need to have code for several things in all of our version control systems. And what this does is it gives us the ability to replicate environments, to spin up environments. Um, if we have something happen, we need to spin up environments that allows us to do that. It also allows us to spin up environments, prod-like environments for dev and for test. Throughout that whole chain. Now, here's the exciting thing. So this is a structured equation model, stats, statsy. Um, where you see an arrow, you can use the word predicts, impacts, drives. So these are more than just correlations. These are predictions. So can you, continuous delivery makes our work better. It drives lower change fail rates. It predicts IT performance. Um, we see this great quote from Yahoo. We never had testability before. We have it now. We have this experience and we know stuff is working and it's working with controls. They were able to drastically um, gain efficiencies in deploying their infrastructure and improve their time on patching infrastructure. They can now patch their entire infrastructure within six hours of a patch being made available. So it makes your work better. It also makes your work feel better, which I think is just as important. So continuous delivery makes our work better. It also decreases feelings of burnout among our tech teams, and it decreases our deployment pain. The other awesome thing is it leads all the way through to increased organizational performance. So it does still help our companies make money. Yes, it is worth the investment in continuous delivery. But what else drives IT performance? Lean management, and these are the key practices here. It's width limits to drive improvement, visualizations to monitor our work, and monitoring to make business decisions. Now, we'll go over the details really, really quickly. So width limits. As a team, we're good at limiting our working process. We strive to limit our width, and we have a process in place to do so. Our width limits make obstacles to higher flow visible at least a process improvement, and they're used as a way to increase throughput. This is actually one of those, uh, width limits, by the way, or one of those really interesting things that are leading indicators, not just a lagging indicator. So it helps us predict what's about to come and what's really gonna go. By having width limits, it helps decrease complexity in our code. It does a lot of really good things for our developers. Um, what is visualizations to monitor work? We can use visual boards to share information, charts showing defect rates. We have a visual mode of um, organizing work. Um, and we can have these on uh, dashboards as well, right? It doesn't just have to be a, a physical board you can see. So this can work for um, distributed teams as well. But it needs to be readily available. It should be displayed at workstations. We need to be able to see what's actually happening on our teams. Um, and then the last one, the key here is that it's monitoring, and it's not just monitoring at the page to wake us up in the middle of the night. That's not fun, right? Because then we're just going to turn our papers off <laughs> or hide them across. Um, so this is monitoring to make business decisions. We use data for monitoring tools to make business decisions daily. We use data uh, to make uh, for infrastructure monitoring tools, and we have automation in place to auto-scale capacity. So the great thing here is that lean management drives IT performance. A good example here is Etsy. Etsy uses uh, a graphing tools to make decisions. Here, uh, the vertical lines represent some kind of code deploy or code push. If the graph drastically changes, the person knows that who, who pushed the code, they know that they should go take a look back at their code. On the off chance that I have, have done the work that I had planned to do for the day, I can go take a look at the graphs that exist, and if someone pushed code that didn't make an immediate change to a graph, but that change then built up later, I can go take a look at a graph and, decide, and I can prioritize work or decide what my next work task should be based on the visualizations that I have available to me. The other nice thing about lean management, it also makes work feel better. It decreases feelings of burnout, and it improves organizational culture. Uh, great
great quote from Julia Wester, who was at Turner Sports and Turner Broadcasting. She said, I was trying to figure out why my team was working themselves to death but not getting anything done. By implementing width limits, we were able to focus on our work. Finishing work feels better than sprinting and feeling like a hero in the moment because that's only a moment. She actually found that by implementing width limits, they were getting more things completed and done instead of having a whole lot of things that were always in progress, always in progress, always in progress. Uh, again, the nice thing is that by implementing lean management, making some investments in mon uh, visualization, some monitoring tools, setting width limits, training your team in width limits, it does pay off in the end. Now, I mentioned organizational culture. <coughs> Take a minute and read through this a little bit. This comes from a researcher named Ron Westrom. When we did our study, we, um, we adapted this tool to become a measure for organizational culture. So as we read through this, who here um, works or has a friend who works in a pathological culture organization? <laughs> who here has a friend who works <laughs> in a bureaucratic organization? I'm like seeing very few hands. Okay, some. Who here works or has a friend who works in a generative culture organization? Who here has a friend that does not want to vote? <laughs> so, what we found is that about half the people work in a bureaucratic organization, about a third are generative, about 50% are pathological. We do find that, that a strong organizational culture, as, as measured by this, and this uh, prioritizes information flow, trust. Um, it, in healthcare and aviation outcomes, it, it tends to predict safety outcomes. But in technology, it does predict IT performance and organizational performance. We do see that it's very, very strong. High IT performers perform the best in this. But it, like I said, I just glanced over it quickly, but I think it's important. It predicts IT performance and organizational performance because it does um, tend to highlight information flow and high trust organizations. And it's funny because some people are like, yeah, yeah, Nicole, you do all the tech, you're the culture girl. Here's something that's interesting. Google found something very similar. They were looking, they had always studied managers, they decided to dig into teams. Their theory when they started looking at this was that they would find the perfect, um, the perfect algorithm to define the team based on skills. They joked that you know, it would take like a Node.js programmer and an R programmer and a you know, person with certain sets of skills. Not at all. What comes down to making the perfect high functioning team is dynamics. And the number one thing is psychological safety. Can I trust my team? Can I feel vulnerable about, around my team? Can I take risks around my team? The next one was dependability. Can I depend on those on my team to get things done? Structure and clarity. Do I know what my work is? Meaning. Is my work meaningful to me? And then impact. Is the work that I do impactful to the business? And will it actually create change? Um, so culture is important. The founder of Intuit has said by installing a rampant innovation culture, we performed 165 experiments in the peak three months of tax season. Our business re uh, result, conversion rate of the website is up 50%. Well, that's money right there. Employee result, everyone loves it because their new ideas can make it to market. Which I think is really, really exciting. And I love the fact that the founder pointed out not only that he's making money and it makes customers happy, but also that the employees are happy and excited about it as well. That's really important. Um, I really love this quote from Greg Linden. So Greg Linden wrote the recommender software at Amazon. As you check out, it brings up recommenders. It, it recommends things that you might want to buy. He walked into his senior vice president's office with this great idea. He had prototyped it out. He had coded it. Um, because as we go to the grocery store, you know, there's always things that you can buy at checkout. And who here like has like bought something on their way out of the store that they really had to plan on buying? It happens to me all the time. So he's like, this is a great idea. The SVP was like, no, absolutely not. Because in a store where they're physically, we can't escape. We can't run away without walking past the register, without having to pay for something online. I can just close the web browser. I can get distracted. I can go somewhere else. So he walked out of this SVP's office, coded up an A-B test, and pushed it into broad, made it live. What? Went back a few weeks later and showed that it made a measurable impact on revenue. Who here can do that and not go raise hands 
and not get fired. <laughs> right? But he says, I think building this culture is the key to innovation. Creativity must flow from everywhere. Whether you're a summer intern or the CTO, any good idea must be able to seek an objective test, preferably a test that exposes the idea to real customers. Everyone must be able to experiment, learn, and iterate. So his SVP probably was thrilled. It was like, you're right. You made a lot of money. Let's push and let's absolutely implement this. Okay. Really quickly, job satisfaction is the number one predictor of organizational performance. We've known it for years in other literature. For some reason, not everyone's convinced that this would be true in technology. Shocker, totally true. The job satisfaction is important. So just to wrap this up, IT does matter. We create absolute value. We create not just competitive advantage, but sustainable competitive advantage now. If we do it with the right mix of technology, process, and a strong culture to tie that together. Because remember, now suddenly we're working with more than just the IT team that hangs out in a corner somewhere. We're working with the entire value stream. So, if you'd like to learn more and receive an exclusive invite to a DevOps benchmarking tool, maybe a chance for a personalized analysis of your results with me, Gene Kim, and Jess Humble, a copy of this presentation, and a copy of the metrics guidance white paper from the DevOps forum, you can send an email to NicoleFB at sendreplies.com. Subject is DevOps. Again, if you want an invite to the benchmarking tool that I'm developing with Gene Kim and Jess Humble, copy of the presentation and a copy of the metrics guidance white paper, you can send an email to NicoleFB at sendreplies.com. Thank you so much for your time this morning, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Nicole, great talk. Um, I'm wondering if you can give some advice to organizations that would like to go to continuous delivery and are not sure which thing they should do first. Like, if there's one thing they could start doing right away to put them on that path. Sure, so we actually see several different paths to success and, and every company is going to be different. So it depends, which I know is like the hardest answer and the worst answer. Um, Definitely having a strong culture is, is going to be really important because you're going to be including so many different people in that, in that analysis, uh, or in that conversation, rather. Um, making sure you have good coding practices, making sure you have things in version control, I would say, is definitely a strong first step because it's so important and so predictive of so many different things across the value chain. And I say version control, but make sure you have everything in version control. So not just your application code, your scripts, everything else. Um, and then maybe the next step that I tend to see that ends up being really important is, is a good, strong automated test suite. Because then you can start integrating more things early on and you have a, a pretty good, um, uh, you can feel pretty good that as you start integrating more and more things that they will be successful and, and your code's gonna be pretty good and more successful as you start integrating more and, and moving down that path. Myself, Bhushan here. This was a very good presentation. My query is on, uh, yeah, DevOps really works for an uh, e-commerce kind of a business, and how actually we can link the DevOps to a highly regulated industry like an aerospace, something like that. And the aerospace industries? So the question is, uh, this appears like it uh, works for web web companies. How can we also make e-commerce e kind of a company? Yeah, regulated. make perfectly sense. But uh, highly regulated industries like uh, aerospace and the pharmaceuticals and oil and gas industries, how exactly this works? So we actually do see this working quite well in highly regulated industries like aerospace. Um, I was just chatting with uh, the CISO of American Airlines the other day, so aerospace uses this quite a bit. It actually works really, really well for them because by using, um, by using things in code, by, by, by um, putting things like regulatory changes in code, compliance in code, infrastructure in code, it makes a lot of their work much easier because they're their auditing processes are much more straightforward now. They can see everything in code. Um, it makes so much of their work more straightforward and very transparent instead of things being hidden in, in books or in papers or in PDFs or in people's heads. It 
um, it kind of surfaces a lot of the process and it makes it much more consistent, much more reliable, it really increases the value of the function of what they're doing. And it makes um, things like security and patch management much faster and much more, um, it helps you kind of roll it out to your entire infrastructure a lot faster. And we're seeing that quite a bit right now, particularly in the financial industry, which is also highly regulated. Yes? Yeah, I just have a, a reply to that as well. Um, I, I'm Des Humble, who Nicole was just talking about. Um, the US government is actually um, implementing a lot of these practices. Uh, to send a service in the US government live, there's over 4,000 pages of regulation you have to read in order to be able to comply that that service can be sent live. Uh, and what they're doing at the moment is actually creating a set of automated scripts that you can run to validate those compliance regulations that are actually implemented by your service. So the ability to actually take these <coughs> regulations and turn them into tests that you can run against your systems um, is very, very powerful and they've been able to cut down times to go live uh, to get this authorization from nine months to uh, days, basically, by implementing a lot of these ideas. So it's actually very, very powerful, uh, particularly in areas where you have high compliance. Um, we're also seeing people implement it um, or automate certain things if, if you're in a highly regulated environment where people are really, really worried about this, we're seeing people roll it out uh, differentially based on risk profile. So sometimes that can be one really good way to start introducing this is, is in introducing automation for things that have a really low risk profile and then start increasing it to things with a higher risk profile as you go. Although in some ways you, know, you may argue that you prefer automation where there's a high risk profile because then people who chat, lie, cheat, steal constantly are involved. But, but you can also do things based on this profile as well. Anybody else? Good morning. Uh, I have a question. So we discussed about uh, DevOps and process type with continuous integration and, and delivery. Uh, the question is, uh, do we need to bring it up front because in practices like unit testing and if our organization is embarking towards continuous integration and delivery and DevOps culture, uh, how it should be phased out? Should we start, start up front with engineering practices like automation, unit testing and uh, run the DevOps uh, culture or progress in parallel or we can phase it out in uh, two phases like uh, in your practices earlier and then we go for uh, the integration and delivery aspect. Um, so you're asking if you should do the, the tooling piece first or the practices yes. piece first? Yes. Yeah. Um, again, I see, what I tend to see is companies do the tooling piece first because like you just buy it and that seems to be easier. I would say I'm looking over at a couple of people because that's what I tend to see is like you just buy the thing and do it. Um, but generally when you when you start implementing a new technology or a new tool, I would also take that as an opportunity to start implementing one or two actual like agile practices or, or um, lean practices at the same time because you're going to get that sea change and that excitement and that, that culture change at the same time. And I would take advantage of, of getting everyone excited and doing not every single thing all at once, but, but take one or two things 